lesson 64, connected objects. Okay. We will explore how Newton's laws apply to connected objects. Now, connected objects is um, part of a um, part of a two-part sort of um, thing. There is a small part today, and there is a bigger part tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, what we're going to talk about is um, inclined planes. But both of these are supposed to be around the same theme of, um, and the theme is. Newton's laws in two dimensions. Now, we've already been doing a little bit about Newton's laws in two dimensions, but this will be a lot more stuff, like a little bit more things involved. So how do connected objects work? Well, before we do that, let's just quickly go back to something we did last time. Last time was just a quick ending uh, finishing up on Newton's third law of motion. And I gave you guys some time to work on 4.5. Newton's third law of motion is that every force has an equal and opposite force. So if this rower pushes back on the water, the water will in turn push forward on the... Well, the water will in turn push forward on the... Uh, oars, and that will have a net force of pushing the rower forward. And so that's how this is a, this person is able to move forward. We said importantly that that force is not the same, uh, is the same force, sorry, but the acceleration is different. So the acceleration of this ball is gonna be a lot higher than the acceleration of the bat. And the reason that the, even though the force is the same, because the mass is so tiny in comparison, the acceleration is going to be normal for the, normal for the bat, but huge for the... Because if you imagine, if you take it, if you divide by a small number, it's going to make a large acceleration. And then we also said, the last thing we also said was that, um, that Newton's third law is it's the same force, but has to act on different objects. Now, this next lesson that we're going to talk about is connected objects, sorry. Now, connected objects, when I say connected objects, I mean objects that are connected via something. So in this case, um, in this case, they can, these two objects, this, um, this train is connected via a wire or a um, cable or something. You can have the same situation occur if you've got something vertically being hung. But yeah, the main idea that I wanted to start off with is that forces, yeah, forces on connected bodies, forces can be thought of as two, forces on connected bodies can be thought of to as two separate bodies. Okay, what do I mean by two separate bodies? Okay. So the forces on the train and the carriage are like in many ways unique. Okay, let's start with the train, the engine. The engine of the train has got a force downwards by gravity. Okay. It's going to have a force upwards, which is going to be the normal force. It's going to have a driving force, which is going to be, we're going to call F D for driving force. You, um, you can sort of name it whatever you want, but yeah. Then it's going to have a frictional force, which is going to pull it backwards. But it's also going to have a tension force pulling it backwards, okay? So these are all of the forces acting on the, um, the train, on the engine. You've got five forces, okay? Now, the normal force and the gravitational force will probably be balanced. It's not gonna fall down into the rails of the, 
of the um, carrot of the of the tram rails, but and it's not going to float up into the air. But the driving force, the frictional force, the tension force, they may be balanced or they may not be. It depends. Now that's just the forces on the um, that's just the forces on the engine. That's not accounting for the forces on the carriage. The carriage is going to experience many of the same forces force of gravity, a normal force, oh, sorry, a normal force, ah, oh, I see what's happening here, I'm sorry guys, I've stuffed up multiple times, let's do this, a normal force, we've got a, whoop, Forwards, we've got a tension force, and backwards, we've got a frictional force. Now, that tension force that's pulling forwards is the force in the in this wire. Now, the wire, of course, we're not going to talk about the wire as a separate system, but yeah, there's a wire essentially is going to be pulling the car forward and trying to pull the train backwards because they're pulling against each other. All of these forces are acting at the same time. Um, and all of these forces can be, you can like explore each, you can explore this system as a combination of all of these forces. And when, as I said, connected bodies don't have to be horizontal, you can have parallel. So if you imagine, um, if you imagine something like this going on, so you could imagine what would be an example of that, you could imagine like, a um, pitcher hook, so this could be like an example of a pitcher hook going up here, or maybe some sausages hanging on a, a wire or something like that. Um, they, as I said, they can be horizontal. You could even think about something like um, like a human body. So I was like, I was thinking about this one as well. When I was thinking about a human body, if you've got a um, if your leg has got a muscle, then another then some tendons, then another muscle, then the, and then your foot. So this in this way is like two bodies. You've got one body here and a second body here. And so, yeah, you've got two bodies here. That's just the way that you can think about it. You can break this down into two separate bodies. Or there is another way that you can think about it. Instead of thinking about this as two separate bodies, just like how if you had a human body, you could instead think about this as just one overall body. Okay, so you can think about it all as one system. Now, what? How do you think about this as one system? Well, you could think about this as one system by saying, "Well, this has got a force forward. That's your driving force. It's got a force backwards. That's your." Frictional force. Now, frictional force is going to be the sum of the frictional force on the engine and the frictional force on the carriage. All of the frictional forces added together. You've got a force downwards, which is going to be your gravitational force. That's going to be your gravitational force of your carriage and your gravitational force of the engine pulling it. And then you've got a force upwards, which is going to be your normal force. And this is actually a good way of exploring things when it comes to, well, this driving force needs to fight against the force of friction, but not just the force of friction on the engine, but also the force of friction on the carriage as well. Everything needs to get pulled by it. So this is how we can sort of start to think about this. Is more, is multiple, uh, is an engine, is as a whole system instead of two separate bodies. Now, let's do a question on this. So we can start to get a little bit more confident. in what I'm talking about. At the moment, what I've done is I've just sort of gave you guys a couple of theories and that's really useful but i have to give you 
an actual problem. So let's use our engine and our ideas that we've already come up with. And let's create an actual question. So let's do, and I'm, I've made a question already. We're going to give this one a try. A 15,000 kilogram train engine is pulling a 10,000 kilogram carriage along some rails. The engine experienced 12,000 newtons of frictional force, but the carriage only experiences 8,000 newtons of frictional force. What drive force is required by the engine to ensure the whole train accelerates at three meters per second squared, assuming no friction? What drive force is required accounting for friction? And what is the force at which the carriage is pulled? So, now you guys might want to jot down the questions as I as I do them. But so I'm gonna might maybe leave this up for a second just because I I know and I'm, give me a second second to eat some of my breakfast. I got up very late, guys. But yeah, have a quick read of this before I start to work on it. Okay. So let's do the first one. What drive force? is required by the engine to ensure the whole train accelerates at three meters per second we're going to assume no friction decide to add this question in because look i thought it might make sense to start off by just without friction let's not worry about friction let's just deal with it so in order to do this what we're looking for is we're looking for f net we're looking for we want to know what this net force forward is going to be. Okay. Now this net force forward will then help us figure out, well, how much force do we need to do? So what we need to do to calculate F net is we need to do, and I'm going to probably do the working out for this one over on the left here. F net equals mass times acceleration. Well, we know that our acceleration has to be three meters per second. Okay, but uh, what's our mass? Well, the mass is not 15,000 kilograms. Because remember, the engine has to accelerate the whole train. Okay, and so that driving force doesn't need to just accelerate just the engine. It needs to accelerate the engine and the carriage. So therefore, our mass is actually 15,000 plus 10,000. It's the mass of the whole train. Because ultimately, that's how much we need to accelerate. If for some reason the, uh, if for some reason the train carriage came loose, and we only had to accelerate the engine, sure, you wouldn't need to put in as much, you wouldn't need to add that 10,000. But because it is connected, we need to add it. So that becomes 25,000 times three, which is gonna become 
75,000 newtons. Yep. So therefore, our forward force is has to be 75,000 newtons. That's how much force we need to apply to make sure that this train is moving forwards at three meters per second squared. So I'm going to write that down here, 75,000 newtons forward. Okay, what driver forces are required accounting for friction? Okay, so now we've got friction to deal with, okay? So I'm going to switch to red because friction, in my opinion, feels like red. And we've got two forces of friction. We've got a friction of 12,000, which is acting on which is acting on the engine. So this guy's being pulled backwards with 12,000 newtons of force. Whereas the carriage is only experiencing a force of friction of 8,000. Now you guys might be thinking to yourself, well, um, well I was, okay, I would be thinking to myself, well, if I was in your world, guys, these two numbers are different. Are these two numbers allowed to be different? And the answer is yes. Okay. The, my theory about this is the engine is a is weighs more because the engine weighs more. It's going to push down on the rails more, which means it's going to have more friction. It's going to be harder to push because it's going to you know have a greater contact area. And just because you've got two objects with great with different amounts of friction doesn't mean that you can't tie them together. It means that it's going to affect the situation a bit. Like you could have a really, really, really light object that has a lot of friction. So therefore, it's gonna affect your system, doesn't matter how heavy it is. There are also some formulas that we could use that link the gravitational force, the amount you push down to your frictional force, and it does, um, or your normal force to your frictional force, and it does relate to mass. So this is sort of not too far in the ballpark. Now, the problem is though, is that these are two individual frictional forces. What we now need to do is we now need to say, well, well therefore the net frictional force is gonna be the sum of these two. So therefore, we're pulling backwards with a force of 20,000 newtons because 8,000 plus 12,000 is 20,000. Okay, I might even, I'll write that calculation up here just in case the frictional force is equal to 8,000 plus 12,000. Now, here's the thing, right? And I'm going to do this. I'll, no, I'll do this in red still. Our net force is going to be equal to our driving force, right? Minus our frictional force. Okay. The amount that we, the overall force that we go forwards with is going to be equal to the driving force subtracted by the frictional force. So the amount that we push forward minus the amount that we get pulled backwards. Now we happen to know that our net force happens to be 75,000 newtons. It has to be 75,000 newtons, otherwise we won't accelerate at three meters per second squared. We know that our driving, we don't know what our driving force of the engine is, but we know that our net force is 20,000 newtons. So we can then figure out that our driving force has to be our net force plus 20,000 newtons or 95,000 newtons overall. Now, I want you guys to think about this for a little bit, and then hopefully you guys can see why. The driving force of the engine now needs to be more than 75,000 newtons, because now the driving force of the engine has to overcome 
the frictional force. We need to add that frictional force to that driving force so that when you subtract it, you get, you get the same F net. And that's how we get 95,000 newtons worth of force forwards. Now I'm going to pause here for a second. Is everyone okay? Is anyone confused? Does anyone want me to re-explain this again? Like you can say it in chat privately. I'll just say someone privately in chat said they wanted me to re-explain this part. Or if we're all cool, I can, can keep moving on. I just want to check, make sure that we're all good. Because I know this is a bit of a weird idea. Okay, I've heard nothing, so I will assume that we're fine. What is the force of friction of the cap? What is the force at which the carriage is pulled? Now, this is the last part. This part is asking us to now, instead of thinking about it as a system, to think about this two bodies. So with this last part, we want to know what is this pull force here? What is this pull force? What force is it being pulled at? Well, we can calculate that if we think about it again as all of the forces acting on this object. We've got this pull force. Now you could call this a tension force. It doesn't bother me. We've got a pull force here. We've got a frictional force here. And then, oh, and then, so those two are going to add and subtract. And overall, we're going to end up with a net force. So our net force is going to equal our pull force. Whoa, I don't know why that zoomed in, sorry. Our net force is going to equal our, it's going to equal our pull force minus the frictional force. This is actually very similar to what we just did before. And net force uh, here where we said, uh, up here where we said uh, our net force is our drive force minus our frictional force. But this time our net force is our pull force minus our frictional force. So let's, let's talk about well, what's going on here. Firstly, what we need to do is we need to calculate the net force. The net force, oh, whoopsies, whoopsies, let's go back. The net force equals the mass times acceleration. The mass of the carriage is 10,000 kilos. And this guy is going three meters per second squared. So our net force is 30,000 newtons. So if we wanted to move just the carriage at three meters per second squared, we'd need 30,000 newtons. we need a little bit more. So again, if we wanted to move the carriage or the engine separately, we would need less force. So we need 30,000 newtons. Now we happen to know that the frictional force is 8,000 newtons. It says it up there. So I can, we can now substitute these values in. Minus 8,000. We've got a driving force of 30,000 newtons. And that is going to equal the driving force. 
or the pull force or the tension force or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. So our pull force is going to equal 30,000 plus 8,000 is going to be 38,000 newtons. So that's the, that's the pull force. That's how much that this engine is pulling forwards on it. So much is 38,000 newtons forward. And you could also do the same sort of thing. You could say, well, how, and by the way, because action reaction, if the, if the engine is pulling the carriage forwards with 38,000 newtons worth of force, then that means that the carriage is pulling the engine backwards with 38,000 newtons worth of force. And you can use that because you can use that information to help you sort of figure out what are the forces acting on the engine itself. Because that engine is going to have a drive force, but it's going to have a frictional force acting on it and a force forward and a force backwards. And the force backwards by tension is going to be that, is going to be that 38,000. Now I'm going to move away from the slide in a second, unless there are any questions about the slide. So whilst I find some of this stuff confusing, ultimately it and yeah, it uses all three Newton's of Newton's laws and force diagrams. One of the ones I love about this, the reason I think this is an interesting thing to teach is because initially when I showed you guys uh, force diagrams, it was a bit, how do I say this? Um, when I showed you guys built force diagrams, I didn't actually put much of Newton's laws into it. This is the first time we sort of added Newton's laws to force diagrams. And so therefore it makes it a bit more confusing, but also a little, little bit more rich. It sort of hopefully gives you guys an idea, oh, okay, this is why those diagrams are important. I did a small diagram in the middle though. This small diagram though helped us understand that the net force was positive, the pull force is positive, but the frictional force going in the opposite direction is negative. And that's how we use this picture to get this equation. And I think that's important. Let's now jump ahead. I've got one more question. I don't think I'm going to get, might not necessarily get time to complete all of the questions, but I want to give it a try. So now a little train's going to keep going, but oh no, tragedy. It's a, it's a, it, oh, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. I actually don't care about this second question, to be honest with you. I just want to get this first question done, if possible. Tragedy strikes, the 15,000 kilogram engine goes over the edge of the cliff and pulls on the carriage. The 10,000 kilogram carriage still experiences 8,000 newtons of force. What, what is the acceleration of the carriage? So how quickly is this carriage getting pulled to the right? Now, some of you guys will be saying 9.8. I'll be like, yeah, could be 9.8, but it, it's not. The reason it's not going to be 9.8 is for two reasons. One because there's 8,000 newtons worth of force of friction. And the second reason why it's not going to be 9.8 is because 9.8 means is the acceleration by gravity on an object. This whole system is not experiencing gravity. Only one part of it's being accelerated by gravity. So that's why we've got a bit of a different situation here. I got, want you guys to think of, um, I want you guys to think of a shoe. I want you guys to think of a shoe sitting on a table. You ever think of a shoe sitting on a table? What the heck? Isn't this a story about, isn't this supposed to be about a, um, a, a train? That shoe, if you dangle the shoelace over the edge, right? That shoelace experiences gravity, but just because the shoelace experiences gravity doesn't mean the whole shoe 
gets pulled off the table because ultimately the force of friction on the shoe is large enough to keep it on the table to stop it from accelerating off the table so therefore the frictional force of this train it might even be large enough to stop it from slipping over the edge the only way to do that is to start to explore the forces. So let's look at the forces acting on this system. So we've got a force, we've got a frictional force this way of 8,000 newtons. We've got a, and then what we'll do is we'll draw in the pull force. We've got some pull force. We don't know what it is. Now, on this one, we've got a similar, we've got a pull force backwards. And these two are going to cancel each other out, but that's fine. And then we've got a gravitational force. Now, I know this is a little bit messy, but we're going to assume that this, um, this pull force here is, we're going to assume that this is acting in the opposite direction of the, of the engine, of the gravity, gravitational force. Now, um, some of you guys, and some of you guys will say, but sir, this wire is at an angle. And I'm like, yes, I know, but we're not going to deal with angles and stuff that's going to make this like 10 times worse than it needs to be. So we want to know what the acceleration of the carriage is. So that gravitational force is going to try to accelerate everything. So let's work out that gravitational force first, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go F of G. Now that gravitational force is going to be mass times uh, the gravitational acceleration. Now it's not going to the force of gravity is only pulling the engine down. Not, it's not, well, it's only acting on the engine. So that's the only way that we can get this force. So let's work it out. It's going to be 15,000 kilograms times 9.8, which I think from memory was 147,000. Because I did this last night just to make sure I knew how to do it so I didn't stuff up. I don't always do that. 147,000 Newton worth of force. Okay. Now that's going to, that force that's being, that's act, that's pulling the engine down is also going to be pulling the carriage down as well. Okay. So um, that should give you an idea of what's going on here. That's going to be the, um, and so what we can do now is we can sort of say, well, um, we can say we've got well, 147,000 newtons going down. If we were to look at the system as a whole, the system's got two major forces acting on it. Okay, Let's look at the system as a whole. The system as a whole has two forces. It's got this pull force downwards and this frictional force. So the net force... The net force is going to be the force of gravity minus the force of friction. Now, if these two things were the same, then you would have um, zero net force. So this would fall at a, a constant speed, or in fact, it might not fall at all. But if you look here, the force of gravity minus the force of friction, 147,000 newtons minus 8,000, because that's going to be the force, is going to have a net force of 139,000. That train carriage is going over the edge because it's got a massive force pulling it over the edge. The question is, is how quickly is it going to go over the edge? If our net force is 139,000, and remember that net force needs to pull the whole system. That net force is acting the whole system. That means that if F net 
equals mass times acceleration. The net 139,000 is going to equal 15,000 plus, where is it, plus 10,000 times A. A is going to be equal to 139,000 divided by 25,000, which equals 5.56. So, what is the acceleration in the carriage? 5.56 times 10, uh, whoops, times 10 to the meters per second squared. Um, yeah, forward. By the way, that's also the acceleration that the, that the, um, train engine feels the train engine will fall at 5.56 meters per second squared not 9.8 if there wasn't attached to the end if it wasn't attached to the um to the engine then it would then it would fall at 9.8 and some of you might be saying what about friction even if there was no friction right that train engine would still need to accelerate the whole system so even if there was no friction it still wouldn't fall at 9.8 meters per second and i want you guys to think about that the next uh during the day i want you to think about like objects sitting on tables as they if they're attached to something on the table they might fall off the table but they won't necessarily fall off the table as 9.8 they will probably fall off a little bit slower and that's why now i don't have time to answer this bottom question but this bottom question is just you know it's just the kinematics question it just says now that you know that it's 5.56 and you go uh you, s equals ut plus half at squared what i'm going to do guys because we're running out of time is i'm going to put this question here that i didn't get a chance to go through i'm going to put this question on uh, at recess, I'm going to put this up on the Google Classroom. I'd like you guys to give this question a try for homework. It's pretty much the same question, but different numbers and it's being rearranged. I've actually got answers for you guys that you guys can use. I'm going to put this up and I'll go through it super quickly at the start of the next lesson. But I want you guys to give this a try on your own. Well, I'm going to have to, it's, I can't do this right now because I've got another class now, but I will do that. Um, I'll just put this up for you guys at recess. So once you give this a try as homework, okay? Otherwise, uh, we're running out of time. So I will see you guys um, tomorrow. For